What is it like to be a pop star? How about a pop star who's strategizing a comeback after a public breakdown? How do you balance the power and vulnerability of fame? How might desperation for a legacy attract predators? Does a tortured artist make better art? How much control does an artist have over their image and how far would they go to get it? And lastly, does the music industry breed monsters? The Idol tries to explore these questions, but by the end of this series, I was left so disappointed. This show has been criticized for over-sexualization, cringy dialogue, poor pacing, and the fact that it's honestly boring. But I think the worst sin of all, the world-class sin, if you will, is that I feel robbed of a good story. Because as much as this show has flaws, there are fascinating elements that we get so close to touching on before they're swapped for a cringy cult leader and repetitive BDSM scenes. So instead of focusing on everything wrong with this show, I wanted to focus on the potential this show had because you can see it bleed through each episode. This is a story about an elusive career with calculating characters. It has several celebrity actors and is produced by an international pop star. This screamed potential and could have been amazing. Before we get into it, let's just go through some quick background on this show. The Idol is created by the singer The Weeknd and Sam Levinson, the creator of Euphoria, who I had a massive bone to pick with for that second season season if you haven't seen that video already. Originally, the director for the series was Amy Simetz, who filmed 80% of the show before it was scrapped for focusing too much on Lily Rose Depp's character and not enough on The Weeknd's. The directing was handed to Sam, who re-envisioned the show with a new narrative, and here we are. The original story was reportedly a dark satire of fame and about how a pop star overcomes falling victim to an industry predator. It was also about how she finds herself sexually, but the re Rewrite became far more explicit and gratuitous. There are also several sources that point to a chaotic reshoot with several script changes. Now, I don't know what happened. I don't even know if the original script was good. What I can talk about is what I saw on screen, and I'm gonna talk about the different ways we could have approached this story with both plots in mind. So the plot that was originally reportedly planned and the plot that we got. So with that, let's discuss the several missed opportunities in each episode and what we could have seen instead. And I will be spoiling everything, so this is your warning right now. In the first episode, we meet Jocelyn, a pop star amid planning a comeback. We learn she suffered a nervous breakdown a year ago after her mother passed away, which caused her tour to be canceled and her career put on hold. Now, her and her team must strategize a commercially successful single to regain ticket sales. I actually think the way this episode opens is quite interesting, and I'll admit, I was pretty intrigued. We start with an intimate close-up of Jocelyn. Photographer tells her to adjust her expression, which she does effortlessly. It's all in one take and it's impressive that Lily and Jocelyn can cry on the spot like that. We pan out to see this isn't intimate at all. There are several people watching her and controlling the image. She's half naked with props around her to suggest her celebrity status and previous year's hardship. Someone steps in to adjust the set and Jocelyn immediately steps out of her tears to smoke a cigarette. I quite like this opening because you can see what it takes to coordinate a pop star's image. The set is meticulously planned and there's no sense of personal space and we learn that Jocelyn is an excellent actress. Throughout the episode, there's a common theme of Jocelyn's team discussing her without actually talking to her. This establishes a main theme of the series. Jocelyn's image is highly controlled and lacks her own input. As a pop star, Jocelyn is a money machine. Her team's main priority isn't Jocelyn's opinions, it's a profitable reputation. We meet Sander, the creative director, and Nikki, an executive from her label Magistrate Records, while they discuss Jocelyn off to the side. Xander questions whether the photo shoot is conveying the right image. Is wearing a hospital band while in lingerie romanticizing mental illness? Nikki says yes, but it's okay because a mental illness is sexy. To the average person, Jocelyn is unrelatable and untouchable. The only way you might ever have a chance with her is if she was mentally unstable. Therefore, it's sexy. Nikki represents an unempathetic business person with flawed, morally corrupt logic. This warped conversation 
lets us understand Nikki's belief system and is the first of many times the team discusses the marketability of Jocelyn's mental health. Jocelyn shows her bare chest and the intimacy coordinator steps in saying they can't photograph her exposed like that because it's not in the nudity writer. Jocelyn becomes annoyed. She herself chose to disrobe. Does she not have control over her own body? The intimacy coordinator is framed as an obstacle that limits Jocelyn's freedom. It's supposed to be another example of how she doesn't have control over her image. This is also a little bit satirical and I did think some of his lines actually were kind of funny, but story-wise, I think a more logical way to discuss this concept would be if someone from her team or label was against nudity. Maybe we can be sexy and romanticize mental illness, but going bare-chested is too much to sell to 14-year-old girls. That would add to the irony of her image. Then we would be criticizing the ethics of controlling someone else's choices and body rather than a process which makes complete sense. We then learn of Jocelyn's leaked lewd photo, a PR disaster for her image. To control the situation, her team continues to leave her out of the loop by hiding her phone and discussing how to protect her reputation without her. Then Talia, a writer for Vanity Fair, arrives. Talia has leverage with how Jocelyn's image will be perceived, so the team gushes about Jocelyn. Her team also continually corrects the language of those around them when discussing her difficult year. She isn't damaged, she had problems that she overcame beautifully, and she never had a psychotic break, she was just tired. They're constantly trying to control the narrative to be as positive as possible. Possible. And they do the same thing with the leaked photo, ensuring the press writes about revenge porn and paints her as a feminist icon. Her team is insistent that she's issue free, while they're clearly still worried she's on the verge of another psychotic break, which would damage her career and thus make them less money. This is concerning because as they're talking, we see Jocelyn have trouble during rehearsal. They disregard it and call her a trooper and a princess. This is also where we meet Diane, a highly talented backup dancer and friend. We learn from Andrew Finkelstein, a sleazy Live Nation rep, that her tour isn't selling. So this raises the stakes for her single to do well, while also makes the lewd photo an additional problem. The irony is that her team encourages risque photo shoots, explicit dance moves, and next to nothing clothing, but when it's something they can't control, even if it's in the same sexual realm, it's a catastrophe. They also reference Jocelyn's young fan base, and I think that this dynamic could have been expanded on, given that they are intentionally selling a provocative image to 14 year old girls. I'll touch on how I think they should have incorporated the public perception a little bit better later, but also on the topic of Jocelyn's sexuality, we learn that Jocelyn was a childhood star and there's a trend for young women in show business to be good girl role models, but as they get older, want to embrace their sexuality more. And there's a lot of stigma, shame, and judgment that comes with this transition. Since so much of this show is centered on the lack of control Jocelyn has as with her image, it would have made more sense for Jocelyn's final evolution to be radically different by the finale, from something like Hannah Montana to Miley Cyrus, if you will, and to see what it takes for this growth to happen and what sexual empowerment really means. But as we'll learn, she really just goes from sexy to extra sexy. When Jocelyn learns of the photo leak, she says it could be worse. Everyone agrees, even though they were freaking out about it for like the last hour. By now we're halfway through the episode. It kind of drags for a little bit, but I honestly thought that this first half was actually pretty okay. But here's where it all just goes downhill. To de-stress from the day, Jocelyn goes clubbing with Diane. The club is owned by the absolute worst thing about this series, the weekend's character, Tedros. He hits on Jocelyn and they make out. The only note of interest during this scene is when Tedros says pop music is a Trojan horse. You get to make people dance and sing to whatever you want. Now, okay, it's a bit corny, <laughs> but, but it's also so true. Like there are several upbeat songs where you mindlessly sing along to and you don't notice they're dark until you really listen. I think pop music can be powerful and often is overlooked. Jocelyn is intrigued by this idea and her desire to create powerful music is a theme throughout the series. Then we get the first self-pleasure scene. This might sound very odd for me to say, but this is probably one of the better sex moments in this show and there are so many sexual moments in this show, but at least we learn something. This scene tells us that something about 
about Tedros turns Jocelyn on and she has some kinks. We switch to Talia interviewing Jocelyn. Talia pauses the recording to seemingly build trust, but Jocelyn dodges the attempt and restarts it. Jocelyn is experienced, guarded, and knows Talia isn't genuine. She avoids a sensitive questions about her mom and the leaked photo. We see Talia can't manipulate Jocelyn, yet for some reason, Tedros can. Out of all of the side characters, Talia is one that should have had a meaningful through line throughout this series. Much of Jocelyn's story is about image. Her image is controlled by everyone but herself. We see how this is beneficial to her. Her team's PR successfully manages her photo leak, and we see how this limits her. She can't create the album cover she wants, and we learn she isn't happy with the sound they're pushing her to make. Jocelyn's team wants an image that will sell. We learn later that Jocelyn wants an image that will mark history. Talia wants a story, and it doesn't matter whose image is ruined in the process. Via interviews, Jocelyn has the opportunity to control the narrative, but she understands that Talia is just as ruthless and untrustworthy. I think Talia could have been such a menace for Jocelyn, and it would have been really interesting to see the power struggle between the two. In addition to her team, how much control does the press have on her image? How might Jocelyn try to curate a specific reputation only to have it twisted in articles or social media? And if we're going to keep the twist at the end, interviews could have been a really effective way to sell her story via misleading flashbacks. How she answers questions or avoids them could reveal essential details about her character over the series, especially on rewatch. With less than 15 minutes left in the episode, we finally get a glimmer of insight into the main character's thought process. Jocelyn is afraid her comeback won't be received well and that her single is embarrassing. Her best friend and assistant assistant Leia reassures her the single is great, but Leia is also on Jocelyn's payroll, so this makes us question if she's even honest. What if she's just trying to keep Jocelyn from spiraling again and therefore keep her job? The loyalty of Leia is brought up so many times, and I really actually like this concept. I think it's really interesting, but it barely goes anywhere. The only thing we ever hear is this arrangement is a great deal for Leia, but are you sure it is for you? We don't know the depth of their relationship. I I can't tell you if it's surface level or not because the most we see of them together is this scene and Leia opening her curtains in the morning. Not exploring the relationship between Jocelyn and the people around her I think is a missed opportunity that continues throughout the show. Why should I believe these two are best friends and why does it even matter? Even if Jocelyn is an unreliable perspective, you can still make these characters spend time together and build out their personalities. Perhaps Leia is her only true friend friends in LA, and we see several instances where they're bonding. Maybe Leia desperately tries to remove Tedros and does more than just talk about it, and Jocelyn has to choose between keeping up her ruse with Tedros or her childhood best friend. It would have been more impactful and riskier for Jocelyn if Leia was the one who was fired in episode 3. This would lead to greater consequences like Jocelyn missing interviews with Talia or experiencing true loneliness. Perhaps her desire for the perfect public image would sabotage the image she has with her personal connections. And maybe if we keep the twist at the end, we realize she never cared because she's selfish and has manipulated Leia from a young age anyway. By the end of this series, I don't even know if she ever manipulated Leia. It's very confusing. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Jocelyn calls Tedros and he arrives in the most like embarrassing entrance. This is not intimidating. The only noteworthy thing that happens here is Tedros uses BDSM foreplay to block out the world so Jocelyn can sing more believably sexual and she's into it. End episode one. So before we get to episode two, let me just go over what is set up for us. Jocelyn is worried her comeback single isn't authentically her and that it will be humiliating. The single is important to re-establish herself as a resilient, healthy, and relevant pop icon. She's having trouble in dance rehearsals, so she might not be as ready as everyone says. The stakes are high for her to succeed because her tour tickets aren't selling. A lewd photo of hers has leaked, damaging her reputation, and her comeback must prove she's healed from her psychotic break due to her mother's death last year. Jocelyn is naturally sexual, a good actor, actress and a masochist. She, for some reason, falls for a creepy club owner who isn't in the music industry, but who she somehow trusts for musical 
difficult advice. We vaguely established the team around her who prioritizes business over her well-being, and we've had several small nuggets of commentary about the music industry and celebrity status. I think if we take Tedris out and speed up the pace a bit, I do think this premise is pretty interesting. Like, that sounds like a pretty good story to me. Even still, we have very little to describe Jocelyn's personality, weaknesses, or beliefs. You could argue this is intentional because of where the story goes, but an unreliable narrator doesn't have to mean a one-dimensional character. Just take Amy Zen from Gone Girl as a better example. I'm warning you now that every episode we're going to go through after this just gets worse. Episode 2 opens with Jocelyn excitedly playing a new version of her single to her team, which includes a lot of sexual moaning. This is her enlightened remix via the Tedros method. It sounds terrible, and her team thankfully shuts it down, but it's another controlled choice she disagrees with. Dejected, she becomes disconnected from meetings and daily life. She questions to Tedros about whether she has artistic vision. And here we get another glimmer of interest. Not only is Jocelyn worried her single is bad, she's worried her entire higher knack for artistry is lost. So now we have an additional conflict. Can Jocelyn rediscover her artistic integrity or will she accept the manufactured sound from her label? When Jocelyn arrives on set for her music video, three hours late because she had to cover up cuts on her leg, which I'm still not sure what the point of showing that was, she isn't pleased with the set design even though she was in the meetings to approve it. This scene is the only scene in the episode that I was really invested in. It's her first time back without her mother. This is also the first time Jocelyn enforces control on her image. She demands retake after retake. She wants to be taken seriously. She mentions improving the lighting, the dancing, her acting. She asks whether they can tweak the set and come back the next day. In some ways though, Jocelyn's worry about her comeback image is partially her own doing. It isn't feasible to change the set so late, especially when she approved the concept. And perhaps she should have pushed back on her sound when she was creating it rather than a week before the single drops. But I was also reminded of the pickiness of Beyonce and how she's involved in every detail of her production. And sometimes she'll say things to her team and her team doesn't listen to her and things don't get done. In one of her documentaries, some set person is like super excited to set the stage with all these candles and Beyonce sees it and she says, this looks terrible. And then they have to take everything away. It's demanding, but this level of perfectionism has created iconic performances that have helped cement her into history. Jocelyn is trying to have this same same level of control, but she only makes the director frustrated, and her team is still dissecting her off stage, comparing her to the other dancers. It's also at this point that we learn she was cheated on. Finally, Jocelyn nails the perfect performance, only to learn the camera was out of focus. Her short-lived excitement is swapped for tears, her feet are bleeding, the makeup has rubbed off on her thighs, she looks defeated. Amid her exhaustion, she has a moment of delusion and calls for her mom. This is heartbreaking. Despite the little I know about Jocelyn, Lily really does like an excellent job of making me feel for her just on her performance alone, and that's not easy. Despite her efforts, Jocelyn fails. She fails herself and her team, who viewed this performance as a test for her stamina. Her mom isn't there to support her. She's on the verge of another meltdown. If we take this scene at face value, it highlights how far an artist is willing to go to create a legacy. Later, Jocelyn reveals that she wants to be a once-in-a-generation artist who makes music that outlasts her. This failure invalidates her, and it enforces the idea that she can't be successful without her mom. This should result in some reflection or action from Jocelyn, especially because it was the one time she exerted control. Does she regret her disengagement in her meetings? Has this failure affected the vision she thinks she doesn't have? Will her desperation cause another mental crash or increase her drive? And now, looking back, did she self-sabotage herself here? I don't think so unless she rigged the camera to be out of focus, she clearly doesn't like the song but was also excited when the final take seemed to go well, and she begs Nikki to redo it the next day. But we know Joss victimizes herself, so was her delusion fake? I mean, I think it's real, but it's so unclear. It just makes this whole emotional scene so much less impactful because you're not sure if it's real. Jocelyn is sent home, and we're supposed to think this failure has crushed her spirit and made her vulnerable, but really, it's motivated her to seek 
take out pain. Had we not had the twist at the end, this series of events would have made a lot of sense for Jocelyn to become a victim. She's failed, she's alone, and she's hopeless. But instead, this failure triggers her to mark Tedros as a victim, who we learn has a musical cult. And then we have the worst sex scene I have ever watched. So let's talk about Tedros for a second. This is like the one time I'm gonna talk about him and then I'm never talking about him again because I don't wanna relive this pain. Tedros is a very misused character. Let's say we stick with the plot that we have. If we keep Jocelyn as a manipulator, you could have easily written him out and instead have Jocelyn manipulate the sleazy characters in her management team. Her team controls her production. Her team is her antagonist. She should manipulate them, not a random club owner. To inspire Joss to reinvent her music, she could still do this through sexual liberation, but maybe it would make more sense if she did this with partners who are nameless, and maybe they each give her a different inspiration. One teaches her pain, the other pleasure, the other patience, thank you next. Then she could infuse those lessons into a new mature image and sound, marking an evolution. Now let's say we go with the story that was originally supposed to happen reportedly. If we make Jocelyn a victim, then Tedros can stay. He can lure her in with the promise of success, power, and found family, which are all things she's lacking right now. And he can restart the cycle of abuse. But to make this believable, he has to gain control of her life slowly and methodically. It can't just be inspiration through sex. Because as much as these scenes are uncomfortable, they're also very boring. Because I get it, these scenes are supposed to be disturbing. But after the first time, I understand they turn each other on, I get their kinky, I get Jocelyn feels inspired, so if you're going to show another sex scene, it needs to give new information. I also feel like Tedros should be intimidating and sort of a very dark, powerful force. And I don't think that The Weeknd was able to emulate that in his performance. Maybe it was the rat tail. The only other thing worth noting in this episode is that Diane is noticed by Nikki and is asked to record a song. She takes Jocelyn's place in the music video. So now there's competition brewing. We also learn Diane knows Tedros. I also want to note here that the plot line with Nikki telling Talia that her article was going to get a lot more interesting goes absolutely nowhere. But anyway, the rivalry plot with Diane, I really think has potential, but we're going to discuss this in depth a bit later. Episode 3 starts and it's the first time Leia doesn't wake Joss up, Tedros does. They go shopping, but not before some morning sex. This shopping scene's only purpose is to show Tedros's possessiveness and toxic masculinity. And of course, another sex scene. At this point, I'm getting flashbacks to Euphoria and Assassination Nation, which is a Sam Levinson movie that also has a toxic masculine character and, like Euphoria, confused feelings for a trans girl who actually happens to be the same actress as Talia. Euphoria also has a sex scene in a changing room. I know it's a fantasy, but it still happens. Euphoria also has a misplaced long musical number in the finale of the second season. I sense some repeating patterns here. Anyway, we don't need this scene because we already know Tedros is possessive when he makes Jocelyn fire her personal chef, which Jocelyn does so Tedros thinks he's in control. And I mentioned before that I really think it should have been Leia because then there's an emotional connection to this loss. The only good thing that comes out of this scene is is these two. I really loved Destiny and Haim. They were a highlight of this show for me. They have such good chemistry. I, Destiny is so funny. I really like these two. I think they're great. By now, Tedros has miraculously taken over the house. Haim and Destiny learn Tedros is bad news, but instead of kicking him out of the house, they pretend to like him and expect three hit songs in two weeks. Then we have some more sex. Joss talks to Chloe, one of Tedros's followers, and reveals that she doesn't like to sing about anything personal. Finally, we get another sliver of insight into her mind. She believes the more you let people in, the more reason they have not to watch anymore. So to her, vulnerability is boring. Mystery is intriguing. Jocelyn is afraid of judgment, so she wants her music to be authentic and less shallow. But how will she be authentic without sharing anything personal? This is some potential that we could have unraveled during a songwriting session, but Jocelyn decides that to her, authentic means authentic sex moans. Then we get 
gets a culty sermon about how saying no is denying yourself an experience and even the worst experiences are valuable because they make better art. This scene is the first instance of the major theme in this episode, which is a tortured artist is a better artist. The cult believes the greater the impact on society, the greater the art. So even if you have to lose a life to positively impact thousands of other lives, that sacrifice is worth it. This is the moral philosophy of utilitarianism, where actions are good if they result in a net increase of societal happiness. This conversation is a bit odd. However, it is interesting because it's rooted in a very real moral philosophy. It's also disturbing because it's still brainwashed. Typically, a so-called tortured artist doesn't willingly submit themselves to pain and suffering just to make better art. It's usually unfortunate happenstance. There are also countless instances where great art comes from joy, happiness, and love. This willful tortured artist could have been a great moment for satire because sometimes you do look at celebrities and you're like, what the heck are they doing? They have the weirdest artistic processes, like some forms of method acting and they just go a bit too far. But instead, this is foreshadowing who Jocelyn is, except her motivations are selfish, not for the greater good. At dinner, Tedros pressures Xander to tell Jocelyn his idea of making the lewd photo her cover art. There's a discussion about whether reclaiming the photo is empowering but Jocelyn is resistant. She wants to be taken seriously and move on from the humiliation. And by the way, I had assumed that Jocelyn herself leaked this photo as some form of rebellion to sort of take her control back, but we never get closure on this. I feel like this photo didn't have the, as big of an impact as it should have had given like the amount of hysteria in the beginning. But anyway, Tedros brings up the importance of risk taking and we see a hint of Jocelyn's defiance. She's experienced in this business and he isn't. He shouldn't talk down to her. There's a back and forth about the risk of overthinking. Tedros calls her superficial. She says her music connects with people and anyway, she isn't relatable. So by now, here's what we know about Jocelyn's musical thought process. One she thinks world-class center is embarrassing. Two, she wants an authentic sound, yet thinks vulnerability is boring. Three, she wants her music to outlast her, but can't control her production. And four, she overthinks everything. We only have two episodes left, and all Jocelyn has done to resolve these issues is have manipulative sex. <laughs> In what ways are we seeing her musical growth or her image evolution with the control she's gained? These are really interesting concepts that I would have loved to have seen be explored. We circle back to the tortured artist theme. She's creatively stuck because in a warped way, her abusive mother isn't there to give her motivation. This is a really horrible story and it makes the death of her mother and the attachment she has to her more complicated. And I really think there is potential here in exploring how an abusive mother can impact the life of a child star. Stage moms who excessively push their children do exist. It would have been interesting to see how Jocelyn's outlook was influenced by her upbringing. Was she born to be manipulative or did she learn it? At some point, did she manipulate her mom? Or if her character was a victim, how did her mom impact her struggle with codependency? To re-inspire her, Tedros proceeds to take the very hairbrush her mom hit her with and restarts the cycle of abuse. At first, we think she's become a victim, but now we know this was her plan all along. Her only path to musical genius is pain. She is a willful, tortured artist. And this is a very depressing revelation. Tedros also asks Xander why he didn't tell anyone about Jocelyn's abuse, and this exchange creates tension between them. Episode 4 starts with Tedros waking up and overlooking Jocelyn's property. Jocelyn is asleep, naked. It's meant to show the control he thinks he has over her. We learn Tedros has a criminal past, including kidnapping, torture, and jail time. But instead of calling the police, Joss's managers infiltrate the house undercover. Through Tedros' connections, the legendary producer Mike Dean arrives. They engineer a new sound, but this is done in a drawn-out montage. As I've mentioned before, a major theme in this show is Jocelyn rediscovering her vision, and we gloss over how the source of her inspiration, which is pain, actually creates better music, just that it does. 
And this again is a huge potential we missed. We could have really explored the artistic process, what it takes to reinvent your image, reinvent your sound, especially because you have an international pop star who makes his own music on your team. It would have been really interesting to add some technical elements into the show and his own experiences just in Jocelyn's frame of reference. One of the only interesting things in this episode, there's a theme where there's like only one interesting thing per episode anyway, is that Jocelyn is given world-class center and is signed to Nikki's record label. And not exploring this rivalry more is a huge missed opportunity. Her and Jocelyn were friends but are now competition. Diane is also the better dancer with no signs of a possible mental breakdown. For the label, she's a better bet for commercial success. And this raises some interesting questions. Even though Jocelyn doesn't like the song, her own label chose Diane over her. How will this affect her mental state or her insecurities of comeback success? Will the two remain friends or become rivals? How will this betrayal from her label affect her relationship with Nikki? This is an urgent situation that Jocelyn needs to address now. And I think this should have been a larger threat to her because Nikki choosing Diane is one more thing that Jocelyn has no control over. This should be infuriating and motivate her to take Diane down. Even though she does do this, we don't see the intricacies of her scheme. It makes me question what the point is if the resolution happens off screen. This is very similar to another rivalry I know. Then we jump to a public like sex scene so Jocelyn can sing better again. Leia is aware Tedros is abusing Jocelyn but doesn't do anything. At first I thought this abuse in plain sight was meant to reflect what happens in the industry just at an extreme almost satirical level because pop stars are exploited often by whole teams and management while under the microscope of the public. It's possible that even with a big audience that no one notices abuse is happening or does anything about it. And Leia spells out this exact concept. It's just Leia expresses her concerns to multiple people several different times. And I just don't buy that she wouldn't do more than talk about it as things escalated, especially since Jocelyn is her best friend. Yes, she's ditzy, but is she really hairless? Isaac tells Leia that Jocelyn is not a human being, she's a star, and stars belong to the world. And this has some truth to it because fans often do believe celebrities owe them their time, energy, and love. Management can see their clients as dollar signs. The press will objectify stars to sell stories. Celebrity can be dehumanizing. The only aspect of this they touch on in The Idol, and not even that deeply, is how Jocelyn's team and Tedros control her. As I mentioned before, I would have loved to have seen the control Talia or the public has on Jocelyn's career. We're told her sales are low in episode one and then high in the finale, but we don't feel the impact Jocelyn has on the world or the entitlement people feel towards her, despite knowing she's an international icon. Jocelyn is also worried about what people will think. We should see some discussion on whether her fans will appreciate a new sound or feel like they're owed what they're used to, thereby confirming her fears. Then there's this whole horrible torture scene with Xander. We think she's brainwashed, but really Jocelyn is in control of whether Xander is hurt. Let's talk about Xander for a second. Xander and Jocelyn were childhood co-stars. He reveals that out of jealousy, Joss's mother forced him to sign a contract so he wouldn't sing. Joss also told Xander not to mention her abuse to anyone. He says Jocelyn controls everyone around her and Tedros realizes he might be telling the truth. In an earlier episode, Xander tells Talia he's miserable because his opinions are blocked by Jocelyn and the label, which side note, Jocelyn grabs her notebook here as if she's going to add this to her story and this never comes back around. But anyway, we also know Jocelyn's mom outed him when he was younger. So these revelations add to why Xander feels suffocated by Jocelyn. Since Xander has an interesting history with Jocelyn and inside knowledge, he has potential to be a force against her. What if Talia also interviewed Xander? Perhaps with Jocelyn's mother gone, he's motivated to get his career back. He goes on record to tell his story story for publicity. If Jocelyn is also giving interviews, then you have two conflicting perspectives. Who do you trust? The public might think, and thereby we might think, he has a reason to lie because Jocelyn sabotaged his career. This is where flashbacks to Jocelyn's childhood would be helpful to build out his character, his relationship with Jocelyn, and slowly reveal the truths and mistruths over the course of their friendship. But instead, 
he's tortured, instantly becomes submissive to Tedros, and then very quickly later becomes supportive of Jocelyn, which really does not seem to match who his character is. Tedros then gets Jocelyn to publicize her abuse via live stream. In hindsight, we know Jocelyn agrees to this because she's a victimizing herself for sympathy. It's especially disturbing because we know some of this story is false, but her decision to live stream should have been framed as an intentional way to gain control of her image. She uses her own social media, not a third party press release, but it feels like she live streamed just because it was easy. She's also changed her stance that vulnerability is boring because now she's being incredibly vulnerable. She's crying on camera with no script. What made her change her mind? You could have easily connected this to the leaked photo. Perhaps she realized sharing makes her more famous, or she liked how she became a feminist icon, but we're left having to accept this shift under the guise that she's brainwashed when now we know she never actually was brainwashed. When Jocelyn learns Diane and Tedros have history, she invites her ex Rob over, and here the seeds are planted of Jocelyn's unreliability. We thought Rob was a cheater, but it was Jocelyn who didn't want to be monogamous. Rob saw Jocelyn be tender with her mother, so maybe she lied about some of the abuse. And lastly, Rob loves that when she wants something, she finds a way to get it. Jocelyn isn't a victim. She's ruthless, cunning, and manipulative. As Rob is leaving, he's framed by Xander to pose for a suggestive photo. Xander is doing Tedros's dirty work, but I have no idea how we go from terrified to submissive in less than 24 hours. Finally, we are at the finale, and this has got to be one of the most oddly paced finales I've seen. It opens with Jocelyn singing a ballad. It has similar themes to World Class Sinner, but sounds more personal. Tedros looks rough and inebriated. He makes a suggestion, and Jocelyn forcefully tells him to leave. Her demeanor confirms that she's always controlled the situation, but this should have been a monumental moment because it's the whole twist of the show. But the episode starts, and she's just in control now. This is the same problem with Joss regaining her artistic vision. It just happens. All Joss needed was a manipulative sex and Mike Dean. Now that she's overcome her writer's blog, she doesn't need Tedros as a muse anymore. Jocelyn recounts the story of how they met, making him look like a desperate washed up talent scout. Then we get our last morning scene and this time Jocelyn is woken up by Leia in a state of duress. Finkelstein wants to discuss the tour. Finally, we bring the tour back up again because we haven't talked about it since since episode one. Leia also tries to tell Jocelyn that Rob has been accused of very serious sexual assault, but Jocelyn is preoccupied. Jocelyn announces to Tedros's followers that they will be her opening act, but these characters really aren't necessary for this story. The point of this show is Jocelyn rediscovering her artistic vision and regaining control of her image, but none of these characters help with that and she doesn't need an opening act to be taken seriously. These characters could have been examples of people that predators prey on in the music industry or give Jocelyn inspiration, but we don't really dive that deep into any of this. Then Jocelyn tells Tedros that Rob is innocent. I don't know why this whole plot point here was that relevant to the story because Tedros's plan sabotages Rob, not Jocelyn. We don't see Jocelyn question if she should defend Rob or not. This doesn't come back to whether she has a trustworthy image. This doesn't affect her, just Rob who she could easily defend, but for some reason doesn't. I think they're trying to show how harmful false allegations are. Rob doesn't do anything, is falsely accused, and loses his career. Jocelyn does everything wrong, victimizes herself, and thrives. But this is a very sensitive issue and is incredibly nuanced. You can have the villains win in your story, but I think to write this successfully, there needs to be thoughtful context surrounding both themes and both characters characters rather than just throwing this plot point in there at the very last minute. Tedros tells the group that sex sells, so when Jocelyn's team arrives, everyone is wearing basically nothing and trying to be seductive. This is the most, like, uncomfortable scene. It goes on for so long. I don't know why they made each person sing a full song. I feel like they could have all done one song together maybe. And the team is very uncomfortable watching, but then they're wowed by their voices. I don't know if this was supposed to say that like sex doesn't always sell and talent does, 
But it's so unbelievable that this team is so wowed by their performance while simultaneously being disturbed by it. Then Xander sings, and I like that he gets his moment, but would he really want to go on tour with Jocelyn after all she's done to him? Is this really consistent with his character? He also insinuates to Leia that Jocelyn is capable of hiding her true self, and this is all it takes for Leia to leave. After all this worry, she doesn't even talk to Jocelyn. I like that she's a character that just doesn't want to have to deal with the characters in this industry, but the way that she leaves is so unsatisfying. Jocelyn gives her big performance, and I will say that I do think that Lily Rose Depp does an amazing job in this whole show, and she really gives it her all here. But this part drags on forever as well, and her performance isn't widely different from anything we've seen from her, so it's not this big evolution. If we had skipped the sex scenes, or if she had a more conservative image in the beginning, this would have been more shocking and new. Nonetheless, it's enough for the tour to be put back on. To remove Tedros from Jocelyn's life, Haim leaks his past to the press via Talia. But I don't know why she would throw away the profile she has on Jocelyn, who is this mega superstar for some unknown club owner. But okay, there's a time jump to six weeks later. It's a ridiculously successful six weeks because Jocelyn has sold out her whole tour and had dropped three hit singles. Tedros loses his club and his reputation is ruined. There's a throwaway line about a walkout happening claiming that Joss's music was misogynistic. This is pretty crazy we don't see this because Jocelyn's greatest fear is that the public won't receive her music well and a whole walkout happened. Is this supposed to show her narcissism that she actually doesn't care what people think? I'm very confused. It would have actually been a really interesting story if Jocelyn had come out with this whole new image and the public reception was terrible and her fears were confirmed. Then what would happen? That would actually create a really interesting second season. Tedros attends Jocelyn's tour, somehow knowing she's left a backstage pass for him. It's under his real name, so they're playing with their cards exposed. He must have a massive ego to expect Jocelyn would think of him, and Jocelyn must have a massive ego to expect he would come crawling back to her after ruining his life. Then the hairbrush is revealed to be brand new. Jocelyn did lie about physical abuse. Her final speech marks her narcissistic and compulsive liar tendencies. She milks how hard the year was for her, then introduces Tedros as the love of her life. So she has the power to ruin him and bring him back from the dead. She owns him. She tells Tedros, I want you to meet my family, referencing the crowd. Tedros previously related family to servants, so I guess this is meant to show Jocelyn views her fans the same way. It would have been interesting to expand on that concept, but alas, another missed potential. Then she orders Tedros to go stand over there, and he does. Bringing Tedros on stage is also the last F you to her team. They hated Tedros, but they can no longer keep her from what she wants. She's in control now. I guess they deserve each other because I feel like we glazed over how much of an awful person Tedros actually is. He's supposed to become the victim, but I don't really have much sympathy for him. This show had potential with A, the story they told, and B, the story they were going to tell, reportedly. Let's assume that this is a mini-series, a self-contained story told in one season. Here is what they could have done for the two different stories. If Jocelyn's story is about a ruthless pop star who victimizes herself while sabotaging others for success, build out the characters who affect her career, remove Tedros, highlight her team, the press, her competition, friends, and frenemies, make them forces against her. Let's see how Jocelyn manipulates her way through an already sleazy industry for total control. Make us sympathize with her at first, then cast a doubt as we see the alternate truths and mistruths throughout her childhood and present day. Let's see how easily the media Media and public warp information. Let's see how easily Jocelyn manipulates us. Before revealing that Jocelyn is no better than the other monstrous-like characters in a cutthroat industry, to reinvent her image, have Jocelyn explore her creative freedom and sexual liberation through various nightlife experiences with nameless lovers because she's selfish and only uses them for her own gain. If instead, Jocelyn's story is about a vulnerable pop star who is exploited by the music business and tries to regain control of her life, craft a thoughtful path to recovery. Her image feels inauthentic and she wants to reinvent herself, but it's disapproved from her label. Her abusive mother is no longer there for her. Use Tedros and his cult to promise success, 
power and found family. At the brink of failure and with a predisposition for codependency, Jocelyn finds confidence and her mother's replacement in Tedros and the cycle of abuse restarts. She bonds with others in the cult and they share enlightening experiences. She has sexual experiences that make her feel mature and loved, but something is off. She has a new image, but it isn't authentic to her like she planned. She realizes Tedros isn't giving her more control, he's taking it. She confides in Leia, who's always been there for her, and escapes. She redefines herself on her own terms, uses the experience to reinvigorate her music to be more personal, is successful, and on the path to resilience. Now, I'm not a writer, and there's lots of different ways you can edit this story. I think we could have at least gotten something better than what we did get. I am cleansing myself from this show and analyzing something happy next, so subscribe for that. I'm curious to know how you would have approached the show. I know there's a lot of things wrong with it, but is there anything that you liked or you thought had more potential that maybe I didn't discuss? That was quite exhausting to relive. I hope you have a lovely day and a better night than I did watching this show. Thank you so much for watching.